Okay, good afternoon and welcome to session three of the spring 2018 Sonokis Digital Classics um, semester. This session is the first of two sessions on markup. The second session will be in two weeks time. Um, and this week we're talking about a slightly more basic introduction to markup, including HTML and XML in um, general terms, and will be presented by uh, Monica Berti, uh, by Martina Filosa, and by myself, Gabriel Badar. Um, but we're starting, I believe, with Monica. Um, so please, Monica, go ahead. Okay, Gabriel, thank you very much. And hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here again with you. <laughs> so I start uh, sharing my screen. Okay, I'm sharing, and then... Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, yes, this session, as Gabriel was saying, is uh, um, about markup. This is the first uh, uh, session, and uh, the session is focused more on, well, HTML and then XML and also Epidoc. But I would like to talk briefly about, in general, about uh, markup languages. And uh, the frame, the context, given that Sunoikis is digital classics, is about uh, working with historical text, not only with text, also with objects, artifacts, and other things. But we work a lot with text. And the idea is, uh, well, to encode the text and to work with digital text. And in this slide, I summarize two important things. And here we have we can have two uh, scenarios because when we work uh, with uh, digital historical text, we can digitize, for example, printed editions and we have an OCR output. This is one possibility. Or we can produce our newborn digital uh, historical text. Uh, and uh, But in both uh, cases, we have uh, two main problems. The first one is uh, character encoding. I'm not going to talk about character encoding today, but in any case, I mentioned this because uh, this is a very important thing, the first thing to see if uh, we have the proper character encoding to have uh, a proper machine readable text. And the second thing is uh, to annotate or mark up the text with semantic and structural information in the sense that uh, uh, when we have our plain text, which is basically a sequence of characters, we need uh, to add something more in order to help the machine to understand the text, to distinguish among different components of the text. And again, summarizing, we can say, so we have data and information to different things, and the idea uh, to, to get information is uh, to combine data with structure, basically to structure data in order to, um, to help the machine to read uh, the text. And here we have many different uh, possibilities for structuring uh, our data. Um, but uh, today we are going to focus on, the, on, on, markup, uh, on markup languages. And here in this uh, slide, I have an example of an OCR output. This is one of the two possibilities I mentioned at the beginning. On the left, as you can see, we have an image of a page of a printed book. And on the right, you have the OCR output. You have a plain text. In this case, yes, we can read uh, the text. Um, uh, this uh, output uh, um, apparently keeps the layout of the printed page, but uh, um, for the machine is just a sequence of characters. And we have to work on this text in order to um, distinguish different pieces of information like the Greek and the Latin. As you can see at the beginning, we have a sort of title, then we have references to the sources, then we have the Greek text, then we have isolated numbers. In this case, they are referred to these single paragraphs. And in this case, they are fragments. So there are different things. And going on with this text, we also have Latin commentaries. Uh, in, we also have the Latin translation of the Greek text. So many different uh, things. Um, in uh, this slide, you can see, uh, again, on the left, uh, you see the plain text. 
And on the right, you see the same text, but as binary data. So this is uh, basically what the, the machine uh, reads, <laughs> is a sequence of bits and bytes. So we have to work a bit on something like that. This is just one example, but we can have other examples like this. So we have to structure the content in order to distinguish between among different uh, parts uh, in the text. And a possibility is to mark up the text. And we will see later today what we mean by that using specific uh, markup languages and also in two weeks uh, when we have our second session about markup. But now I would like, uh, given that we are uh, philologists, we, we like to, <laughs> to talk about uh, the meaning of words. So markup, to mark up the verb markup, mm -hmm. Is, is an English uh, verb, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, we have this definition, uh, to correct or annotate uh, copy or proofs for typesetting, printing, etc., especially by making copy preparation or proofreading marks, to annotate the text. So this is a verb uh, used generally for meaning annotating a text and specifically for a typesetting when uh, we proofread a text, we mark up uh, uh, the text. And in this slide, this is a screenshot from the Oxford English Dictionary online, and you can see uh, different possible uses of this verb in different uh, uh, contexts. And uh, mark up, here I have uh, a simple slide for proofreading, you know, where you proofread the text, basically you annotate the text in red or other colors, and you give instructions or for correcting uh, the text for the publisher or adding other things. So basically, this is basically the mar markup for proofreading. But uh, uh, markup uh, and the annotation uh, of text is uh, uh, an old tradition because since the beginning of textuality and of philology, we have many different examples of markup. We can talk about markup in the philological tradition, and here, of course, I can mention many different examples, but I would like to start uh, with uh, examples from the Alexandrian scholarship. So in Alexandria, starting in the fourth century BC, we have a philologist working with a classical text, Greek and Latin text, commenting them, uh, editing them, working on them in order to establish the best uh, edition. And uh, they advised the critical science, Semeia, for annotating the text in order to uh, annotate, to mark up uh, different uh, things. Here I have a selection with the most famous uh, critical signs used by Alexandrian scholars, uh, starting with the obelos, then we have the asteriscos, the sigma, the anti-sigma, the diplay, the diplay periastic mene. So these are just the most famous ones. You can find uh, uh, complete lists, uh, both in the Gis New Pauli, you have the link, uh, in the entry, uh, under the entry critical science, and a complete list is also available in the Real Encyclopedia. But anyways, you can see, so in red you can see uh, the sign, and uh, they mean different things. For example, a verse is curious, or a verse is incorrectly repeated in another passage, then these signs can also uh, represent the disagreement among different uh, editors. And uh, we have, uh, we can, I can show you um, a few examples for the um, tradition of Homeric text, because we have examples of the use of these Homeric signs in manuscripts. And here I have an image of the famous Venetus A manuscript, a manuscript of, uh, with the Homeric text uh, from uh, the Biblioteca Marciana in Venice. Here you can see we have a page full of different text because we have on, on the left basically the, the, the dark text is the text of Homer, but around it and um, also in the interlinear text, we have other text, commentaries, and not only commentaries, but also critical signs. Here we have another screenshot with uh, zooming the image, as you can see on the left. Uh, of the, on the left side of the text of Homer, we have uh, these signs in red, as you can see. We have the Diplestia Peristigmene and also the uh, Obelos, as you can see. Uh, so, um, marking uh, different things, as we were seeing before. These are critical signs, a form of markup, and then we have other text between 
the lines of Homer commenting, adding different things. This, this is an example of uh, uh, markup. Uh, and again, here you can see so the text of Homer and around it commentaries, the so-called scolia, commentaries about the text of Homer. This is an example in a manuscript, and here you can see in red uh, the parts of the scolia. But uh, we can have examples also of markup in uh, modern um, critical editions of historical text. This is an example of an edition of Aeschylus. As you can see, we have the text, but we have other uh, signs, numbers, and then we have the critical apparatus, and this is in some way a sort of markup, also the critical apparatus where, where we, when we annotate a specific word, um, signaling the, difference, uh, the differences in different uh, manuscripts. So this is an example, and then of course uh, this is another um, slide from the Digital Latin Library project, where we have a description of a critical apparatus, where we have many, many pieces of information concerning the text. In some way, this is an example of marking up the text. And of course, we can have other examples for epigraphy, mark up in epigraphy, definitely. Here we have um, a screenshot from the Aphrodite's in late antiquity. We have a text with specific critical signs for marking up the uh, epigraphical text. This is a text broken, so we have missing letters and other things, and we will talk about uh, um, marking up inscriptions, and then also, this is another example of a printed page of the CIL, where we have a different typographical strategies for marking up the text, and then uh, this is another screenshot, and then we have also examples for papyrology, um, where in this, uh, in this case we have a page with a picture and on the right you can see the text with the specific uh, signs in the Greek text for giving instructions basically to the reader in order to understand specific annotations about the text, like missing letters or problematic letters. Um, then, mark up. So these are um, very few uh, examples of uh, mark up in, um, in the philological uh, tradition. So the verb mark up is one thing, and then we have the noun mark up. So we go back to our Oxford English Dictionary. We can see, of course, mark up is the process or result of marking corrections on copy or proofs in preparation for printing, but in computing, now mark up is the process of embedding tags in an electronic text so as to distinguish the text logical, syntactic, or structural components. Um, so markup now has a specific meaning in computing using um, tags. But of course, there are different uh, kinds of markup uh, languages. Um, and tag, so I mentioned tag because in the previous definition there is this reference to tag, so the process of embedding tags, and tag in English is a character or set of characters appended to an item of data in order to identify it. And I have an example in this case is an example of tags in uh, XML, in extensible markup language. This is a very uh, simple example, but uh, you can see, so this is an entry in a dictionary concerning the word competitor, and here we have information, well, the entry, uh, opening and closing tag, and we will see this in details uh, later. And then we have uh, the orthographical form of the word, hyphenation, the pronunciation, and then also the grammatical function of the word, a part of speech, this is a noun. So with tags, this is a form of markup, we um, annotate different things, in this case concerning an entry, uh, the word competitor, and the definition person who competes. This is an example. Uh, but we have uh, different uh, markup languages, not only uh, XML, and I would like to briefly mention them. And I'm using this uh, entry in Wikipedia because uh, here we have uh, a summary of the main general categories of electronic markup. But in the class outlines in GitHub, you have references to other um, papers uh, uh, and bibliography concerning, in general, markup languages. But I think this entry is a good starting point. And here, in fact, we have the distinction among presentational markup, the first one, 
procedural markup and descriptive markup, just to have an idea of different markup languages. And then in the end, I will also mention new lightweight markup languages like Markdown. So we can start with the first presentational markup. Uh, is the kind of markup used by traditional word processing systems and uh, they produce the so-called what you see is what you get effect. And usually this is what you have when you use a word processor like Microsoft Word or also Apple Pages or something like that. Basically you don't see the, the markup, but you just see, you work on the formatting and uh, you can edit uh, the text. Of course, there are many limitations with these presentational markups because usually it's not portable, uh, softwares are proprietary, etc. So, but this is a form of presentational um, markup and you work in this case on the formatting and, and you don't see um, the markup behind. This, uh, this is an example of a page uh, in Microsoft Word um, where I can work uh, on, the, on the layout, on the formatting of the page. Then the second kind of markup is procedural markup. Uh, and in this case, the markup is embedded in text and provide instructions of programs that are to process the text. Examples of procedural markup is trough, tech, and postscript. And uh, in this, basically, the, 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 the meaning of this definition procedural markup is to give instructions to the machine uh, for um, editing the text. Of course, this kind of markup is focused on, uh, the, on formatting the text, on the layout. And a famous example is a tech and also LaTeX. So tech is a typesetting system. Um, it was uh, uh, developed by Do Donald Knuth in uh, the end of the 70s, in 1978. And LaTeX is a markup language used for preparing text based on uh, a tech. And LaTeX, I think, is interesting, and I want to mention this. LaTeX is uh, uh, used for uh, producing uh, publications, books. So the idea is to get the results. In this case, you can see a screenshot. On the, on, the, on the left, you see the LaTeX input. You can see in green specific instructions for defining the kind of document you are working with. This is an article. And uh, uh, then you have other instructions. And LaTeX is really very powerful for example, for formulas in mathematics, in uh, physics, economics, etc. In fact, it was born um, especially in those fields. And uh, the, the result is great, but it works on the layout, on the formatting, so on producing um, beautiful uh, publications and scientific documents. Uh, is used now also for literary text. This is an example for, for poetry, and you have a link to a specific article describing the use of LaTeX. And uh, is interesting because LaTeX is also used for producing um, uh, critical editions and um, Originally was uh, uh, EDMAC, a program written as a set of plain tech macros for producing really books, critical editions. Uh, as you can see here, this is the result of uh, LaTeX. So you can reproduce uh, a page uh, of a critical edition where you have the text, you have lines, and then you have the critical apparatus where you have many different uh, components. So the result is really, is really great. And if you go to the Comprehensive Tech Archive Network, you can see the LEDMAC um, component for working with critical uh, editions. Um, the third uh, markup is the descriptive, the so-called descriptive markup, which is different from the previous one because this markup is used to label parts of the document rather than to provide specific instructions as to how they should be processed. So uh, the, the, the idea here is completely different in the sense that uh, we want to structure the text, not just to work on the layout and formatting the text to get a specific uh, um, output, uh, but to structure the text, giving information about the different components of the text. As you can see here, they mention not only HTML and XML, but also LaTeX. And here, because the difference between a procedural markup and descriptive markup sometimes is not so clear, and different systems can be used 
for different uh, purposes, but uh, I think that is important to distinguish uh, uh, among them. Um, and today we will talk about briefly HTML and then definitely about uh, XML, which is descriptive uh, markup. Uh, before um, <laughs> stopping, and maybe I'm a bit uh, <laughs> late, I would like to mention very briefly um, Markdown. As you can see in this uh, screenshot in the angels in Wikipedia, there is this reference to lightweight markup languages. Markdown is an example um, used by web writers <laughs> because uh, now Markdown, Markdown has a very simple syntax, as you can see, is a lightweight markup language with plain text formatting and is used a lot uh, in websites, in wikis especially, because the syntax is really very simple. You can focus on, uh, on the text and then you can get different outputs in HTML, also PDF and different things. But again, um, this is something different from XML and I think it should be used for, for example, for editing pages, uh, but again, the focus is more on the layout. And uh, an example, we use it in GitHub when we um, edit our class outlines for uh, Sunoic. Is uh, when we edit the text, we use the markdown syntax and then we get a specific um, result. Uh, and the, uh, there are many softwares where you can uh, write in markdown and you immediately see the result. And in this case, you can see on the left the markdown input and the, and the output. And uh, you can import also bibliographies, you can see here. And there are many other uh, applications uh, now for, for uh, Mac and for, um, for Windows. And is good for simple text, I have to say. It's used for newspapers, for wikis, for, for writers. For um, editions of historical text, it's a bit different because the syntax is, uh, is simple. Um, so before finishing, so I would like to, to summarize this um, concepts, uh, quoting a passage from uh, an article that you have in the class outline text encoding, where we have a definition. So descriptive markup was typically said to identify or describe the parts of a document, whereas procedural markup was a command or instruction invoking a formatting procedure. So this is a, um, a simple definition to remember the distinction between descriptive and procedural markup. And uh, it, it was also often said that descriptive markup identified the logical or editorial parts or components of a document or a text content objects or its meaningful structure, emphasizing the distinction between the intrinsic logical structure of the document itself and the varying visual graphic features of a particular presentation of that document. So for our text, of course, we have two different things. And basically, we can use this uh, uh, description, this definition to distinguish between uh, these uh, two different uh, uh, markups, especially because if we are starting our project, we have to decide what we want to use in order to avoid problems and to use the wrong. Uh, markup. So this is uh, uh, my part. I hope you are still there. <laughs> and uh, I stop sharing. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, great. you are still there. Great. That's great. Um, cool. Thank you very much. Um, I will um, switch to show some slides very briefly. Um, I have very little um, new to present actually in this um, in this section. Um, I will touch on some of the same um, sorts of examples as Monica, but the um, the focus I want to take, I'm I'm going to step away from computers, as it were, and talk a little bit more about um, where Monica started with um, conventional um, use of the term markup, where people did markup using a pencil on on on, on written texts on paper, um, in order to look at the sorts of things that we're encoding when we're marking up a text. Um, and again, some of these examples will be um, will be familiar. So starting from, um, again, this is um, a little bit the distinction between procedural and descriptive um, coming out here. Um, but when, uh, so if you, if you talk about markup to anybody above the age of about 50, let's say, 
they will um, they will understand that you mean um, that you're taking a pencil and you're annotating a printed out piece of text um, with a view to um, giving instructions either to the reader of that text or to the author of that text, instructions for revising it, or to the publisher of that text, instructions for formatting it. Okay. Um, and so um, one example of that is um, the sorts of uh, marks that you might make on the text as shown in this table um, on the screen here, where um, you're effectively giving instructions to the author to say, you know, I like this text you've read, but I think you should delete this word. I think you should potentially add a word here. I think where you've written this text in two paragraphs, I think you need to join those two paragraphs. There's some words that need to be swapped around. Here you've given an abbreviation, but I think you should write it out in full. Here I think you should change the case, the spelling, etc. So there are all sorts of um, uh, things. Most people now are probably more familiar with doing this in Microsoft Word, um, where you would um, you would simply put on turn on track changes, and someone will be able to see the changes directly live in the text um, if you send them a, a copy of the text annotated in this way. But um, but conventionally we've we've done that um, uh, on paper, and, and a lot of people still do um, like to work you know visually on paper with um, with versions of the text. So this is. Um, this is a form of procedural markup where you're giving an instruction to the author to go away and create a new version of their text based on your based on your markup. Um, a slightly different kind of markup, um, but with some of the symbols overlap, um, is, is markup which is instruction to the printer. Okay, so this this stems from a time when people were mostly writing on typewriters, or in some cases even by hand. Um, and but in particular, one typewriter is where on a typewriter you couldn't type in italic, you couldn't type in bold, you couldn't change the font midway through a text, you couldn't change the language um, script um, midway through the text. Um, and so, if you wanted to give instructions to the printer, because printers always have been able to do these sorts of things, right? I mean, if you if, when printers that were typeset using little metallic letters um, in a grid on a on a on a table. I've always been able to change um, fonts and faces and all this sort of thing, um, but typewriters haven't. So, so the authors would, would write their text on the typewriter, and then they would add these symbols to tell the printer this part here, put it in italics, the part that are, that are underlined. Um, these parts here print in a larger font because they're headings. These parts here switch to a Greek font because you know we want these to be something else. Um, various kinds of layout that um, these sorts of instructions. And so these are not instructions to the author to change what they've written. These are not necessarily instructions um, to the reader to understand the text in a particular way, but they're instructions to the to the printer. Um, and again, this is this is exactly the same um, example that, um, that Monica used. Um, I just wanted to highlight the kinds of um, markup that the Alexandrian scholars such as Aristarchus were using when they used um, these um, asteriskoi and um, other kinds of symbols in their um, encoding um, of a text. And in this case, the text is written in the same hand as the markup is written, presumably, um, but the, the instruction, therefore, is not to the author. The instruction is not to a printer, as these texts were, were handwritten and were always handwritten. Um, the instruction is to the reader. The instruction is um, this line here, this um, fourth line down, which has an asterisk at the beginning and at the end, is to be understood as annotated in a certain way. Um, certain of these lines are to be understood as being rejected by the current editor. Um, the editor hasn't just left them out, but they've included the text with a symbol, with one of these um, paragraphos type symbols to say, um, you know, this, this text is, this line is probably corrupt, this line is accidentally duplicated, these sorts of comments that, um, that Monica was, um, was showing you. So this is again, this is instructions to, to the reader on how to read this text. They're adding semantic information, um, but it's in a sense, um, it's telling you how to read the, um, the text. Um, other kind of markup that um, we include in a text is, again, it's very much a convention, 
Um, but if you see this piece of text in here and it were all in the same color and it didn't have all these handy labels on it, you would nevertheless know that it was a piece of bibliography, that the, the name at the beginning was the author's name, that the title in inverted commas was the article title, um, that the secondary title in italics was the title of the journal or larger volume that the article was within, that there are page numbers, year, and so forth. And you know these because of the way the way the text is formatted and because of the way the text is surrounded by these various symbols. This is all this is all markup, right? Um, this is precisely what um, what uh, uh, we do to make to make it transparent to the reader what we're um, what we're saying about this particular piece of text. Um, and this has always been um, this has always been done. This is this is a um, a very early piece of markup. Um, this is a papyrus with some musical notation on it. The musical notation is itself a form of markup. Um, here's here's um, our uh, reconstruction and understanding of that um, markup scheme um, based on um, the content that's on that papyrus. Um, and of course, modern musical notation um, of various kinds. Is I don't think I have a slide with that. No, is is also um, a markup scheme. It's telling you how to read the text. In, in this case, um, it's telling a musician how to play this um, this piece of music. And so it has information about things such as notes, such as lengths, such as tempo, um, pauses, various other kinds of instructions that are that are given literally or symbolically in um, in these symbols in this in this markup. Um, we'll talk much more about the um, Leiden Conventions in a couple of weeks. Monica's already mentioned this, but um, the point um, the point I want to make here is that it's um, it's a very useful analogy to remind ourselves that when uh, when we talk about how arbitrary um, digital markup schemes are, that they are meant to be machine readable, that the relationship between the signifier and the signified um, doesn't have to be um, particularly meaningful, it just has to be um, something that is conventional and that we, we know about. Um, the London Convention is a perfect example of that. The um, London Conventions, um, as we've used them from the early 20th century and earlier um, onwards, are, um, are extremely arbitrary, extremely conventional, are entirely meaningless without their definitions, um, which is exactly what, um, what all markup is. Um, so these so these are some of the kinds of information that you can encode in um, in a markup screen. You can encode structural information, semantic structural information, uh, reading instructions, as I said, editing instructions, printing instructions, semantic information such as titles, language, emphasis within text, special codes and languages. Some of these are specific to certain contexts. Um, so in some um, in some texts, an obelisk in the text will mean that an author is deceased. Um, in other texts, an obelisk will just be a kind of footnote marker. In other cases, it will mean something else. And the context often um, is necessary in order to understand what we mean by some of these um, symbols. Um, and so I'm um, going back to the bibliographic example um, where we have a fairly simple um, or we think of as simple um, bibliographic scheme like this. This is a convention for putting you know, the surname followed by the first name with a comma in the middle, um, the various different symbols, the inverted commas, the formatting of the text. These all um, give us, um, these are all markup um, uh, flags that tell us things about the text. If we wanted to translate this into a quite verbose and unambiguous and machine readable markup scheme, um, such as um, such as XML, we might encode that, all that information um, something like this. Um, and this um, this obviously um, is, as I say, much more verbose and much more um, unambiguous, and that's. Um, that's both a useful thing, but also um, potentially a problematic um, thing. Um, uh, one last example: um, we talked about the um, the modern music um, notation being being a markup scheme that also can be translated to machine readable markup. Um, this 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 image isn't um, isn't high resolution enough for you to be able to see how we map 
from the um, from the staves and measures um, on the left to the um, XML markup on the right. But the the concept um, I think um, is clear. You see what the sorts of um, uh, changes you need to make um, to make something machine readable as opposed to um, to the to the conventions that are human readable, but only human readable if we are trained um, to read them. And so um, I finally wanted to um, pull up some of the issues with um, with markup, um, such as the fact that markup can be very verbose, as we've said. Um, markup doesn't have to be space efficient because it's not um, that that's that's not really an issue um, for it. Um, but it can sometimes make it a little bit difficult to work with um, markup. Um, because it is so space inefficient, um, and that's that's really only an issue probably at, at great scale. But um, but nevertheless, it it does sometimes arise. Um, one of the things that it can um, result in is markup being a lot less human readable than the arbitrary symbols that we've seen before. The two um, they're both arbitrary symbols. They're both meaningless unless we are trained in understanding them. But the um, the markup by being by being so so verbose can um, can sufficiently obscure the underlying text that we're marking up, um, and this this is something that we have to bear in mind when we're marking something up. Um, the the other point I wanted to make, and th these aren't all necessarily problems with markup, but they're things we have to keep in mind when we're talking about markup, um, is that because every markup scheme that we devise, including the ones we've talked about here that are not um, uh, specifically digital, are arbitrary. The mapping between the um, the symbol and the um, the semantics of the markup are, are simply just a mapping. Let's say that square brackets mean lost text. Let's say that an element called supplied means text that the editor has restored. Let's and so forth. Um, this means that markup isn't in itself semantic. Okay? I mean, we, we talk about markup being semantic sometimes, but it's only semantic in as much as we're able to interpret these rule-based relationships between symbols and semantic features in, in the text. And without those rules, we don't have um, a semantic um, markup. Um, markup, therefore, requires interpretation um, in order to be um, useful, um, to, in order to be machine readable. It needs, it needs that documentation. Um, level to it, um, and in order to then be useful again for something, it needs transformation into some format that will be usable by the machine or by further human readers further down um, down the road. Um, standards, of course, make things much um, much more uh, transparent and translatable, but um, even um, some of the uh, very very concrete and specific standards, such as TEI, that will will. Um, see in a minute, and we'll talk um, more about again in a couple of weeks. Um, do allow a lot of wide variation within them, so there, there's a certain amount of um, um, of of flexibility and of human interpretation required in all um, in all decisions about markup, and then in all attempts to interpret markup. Um, and the last two points I wanted to make are um, uh, things just I'll touch on. These are things that will come up in, in discussion, no doubt. Um, and they are that um, quite often, um, just going going back to HTML as, as the a, a fairly simple um, uh, procedural markup language, um, the coverage and uptake of individual HTML features um, has very often been been um, imposed by how well those are handled by browsers that display such features. Which, um, which means, excuse me, which means that it's not um, the rules um, behind the markup and the, de the design features of the markup that has led to their um, definition in a certain way, but, um, but the implementation of them that has led to them being useful. Um, or not, um, which which really does define the fact that this really is um, a markup language that is used when it is useful, um, and therefore you know if um, if there's a really useful element in HTML but no browser handles it, why would you bother using it? Because the only point of HTML is if it can be hand rendered in a browser. 
Um, and the final point I wanted to mention is the point that's often called the overlapping hierarchies problem. And this is the problem that if, if for your markup you use a language such as XML, which pretty much everybody does because it is more or less the only working markup language that, um, that is very well implemented and supported, um, you do have this issue that XML is a hierarchical language. Um, and um, meaning that you know uh, features cannot overlap with each other, um, and the real world is not a hierarchical um, set of set of objects. So if you want to encode in your text pages and you want to encode in your text sentences, um, you do have a problem that um, pages and sentences are not neatly nested um, structures in in real texts. Um, and there are ways around this, of course. Um, uh, otherwise, XML would be unusable, and the, the, the ways around them are perfectly functional, and, and, and everyone's perfectly happy with them. But the fact that we've had to come up with workarounds for things which are perfectly natural parts of our text does suggest that you know we we have made sacrifices when we choose to use a markup scheme. Um, that uh, you know we shouldn't we shouldn't forget that um, that we're using something that wasn't really designed for the same features that our that our texts were. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, and I'll hand over to um, to Martina, who's going to um, give us some um, some examples of markup uh, in the wild. I think. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, Just about. There. <laughs> so I'll share my slides with you. And yep. One second. Um, do you see my slides? Yes. So, um, yes, we'll talk about um, the layout of the text in digital editions used using a metrical inscription on a Byzantine lead seal as a case study, as a small example. And yes, so we'll start from a, a printed edition and we'll, we'll see how we can encode um, some pieces of information that um, the printed edition gives us. So, uh, can you still hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so, um, hey, Martina, only one thing. Can you only uh, start the, I never remember how it's called and I don't remember in German, but if you can enlarge the slides, use the, presentation mode <laughs> okay. so, um, so with uh, especially for YouTube be, okay excellent thank you okay. <laughs> cool. and yes uh, so uh, as I said this is a um, printed uh, edition of a Byzantine lead seal it is taken from the um, SBS um, so it started in Byzantine Sociography, number five, page 17 and 18. Um, yeah. As you see, um, the information that uh, the printed editions, uh, edition gives us um, are the name of the entry, uh, this thing here, which is the accession number, uh, the dimension of, um, of, of the seal, and uh, the, the inscribed field and the which I think is the um, preservation um, condition. And then what is uh, of more interest of, uh, to us, um, which is the um, diplomatic transcription and the um, critical edition. On the other page, I, I didn't make a screenshot of it because on the other page, there's just a very, um, very small commentary um, about some prosopographical issues, which was not of interest to us. So, I said the um, the information that we have are this one entry name accession number which is not an uh, arbitrary ID uh, that is kind of internal to our schema but is the actual inventory number of the um, collection collection then we have the dimensions diameter weight because we are talking about a small round object because otherwise we would have height depth and width for example then, as I said, inscribed fields, condition of preservation, picture description, and I, I won't I won't tackle this um, this thing about iconography and nomina sacra because um, yeah it's 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 a hard 
I'm not the practice one. And yes, the Digital Art Subscription Edition and Commentary. Just, just quickly, um, what I wanted to say, um, all of this uh, information can be found if we want to make it um, machine readable. Um, for example, in the DEI header, just uh, very uh, quickly, we could um, use this uh, publication statement for the entry name, that, and on the right you see the, the, the thing that is in the printed edition, and on the left, of course, uh, a piece of the DEI header. Um, we can have the accession number to, the, uh, to this private collection in the uh, MS identifier, and uh, now we have, uh, we, we can encode also uh, the dimensions, the dimension of the inscribed field, and for example, which would be um, very useful for this, um, for this inscription that we are looking at, the epigraphic and paleographic description, which is actually missing in the printed edition, but whatever. Um, yeah, but what, um, I mean, the example that I wanted to make, um, I mean, I took a metrical inscription, a verse inscription, because, um, first of all, because of my personal interest, but it's not, <laughs> uh, it's not important. But uh, second of all, because um, it's very interesting to, um, to show to the machine, to make it um, machine readable. We want the machine to understand that this is not only um, an inscription of six lines, but it's actually a metrical inscription of six lines. We want the machine to understand that um, it's not only an inscription, but it is um, composed by two um, dodecasyllables. And yes, we want we want it to mark up like that. So um, here you see, um, I'm just typing uh, the, the, the inscription and uh, the pipes, uh, as we know, uh, mean that uh, there is a line change. So as you see, there are six lines uh, and this blue um, circle um, is to identify the, um, the verse. We have two uh, dodecosyllable um, verses. And here you see a screenshot of uh, what in the printed edition um, is to be found. And um, I mean, our goal is to uh, encode what in a printed edition is to be seen in plain text. So metrical inscription of six lines. We want, I mean, border of dots, it's not of interest right now. So, um, uh, Gabi, can you please tell, tell me how much time we have? Because uh, otherwise we could just we'll switch to the oxygen. Um, uh, we, we still have, um, a little over 10 minutes. Okay, cool. So we can do both, actually. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, um, in, um, in this way, I am actually marking up the thing. I'm, I'm, I'm marking up only one information. And I'm marking up that this is an inscription on six lines. So. This is, you can see the tick mark here. And yeah, um, the only thing that the machine understand if we um, write it like this is that we have an inscription of six lines. Whereas we can go, we can go, uh, we can go one step further and uh, tell the machine that this is actually a metrical inscription. This is a first inscription. And we could um, use um, the uh, line group um, element and the line element uh, still maintaining the um, the line break, um, just to make the machine understand that yes, this is an, an inscription, but the whole thing is actually a metrical um, a, a metrical a verse inscription, and it has two different verses. One step further would be um, to uh, tell the machine which kind of matter we have here and its metrical structure. Um, I mean, right now, I don't know if the um, metrical structure of Byzantine matters is, um, I mean, has to be written uh, like 
geometrical structure of um, I mean, of ancient uh, of ancient po poetry. So I just uh, did it like this uh, as I, I I mean as I thought it would be right. Um, so yes, we still see that we have a line group. And in the uh, L element, uh, which I called one and two, because um, this is the only description that we have, and it is uh, the first and the second uh, verse, uh, then we can um, expand uh, uh, the information that we give, telling um, that it is actually a dodecosyllable uh, matter. And then we have, um, we can go one step further and say that the metrical structure is this one. Um, yes, so it, we could do um, we could do um, uh, the same thing in oxygen if you think it's uh, useful to the purpose. Okay. Wait, I think my computer, my laptop froze. Can you still hear me? Do you still hear me? Yes, and, and we we could also see oxygen. So okay, cool. if you go back to oxygen, we, we okay, can see amazing. it. Yeah, 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 it works. Yeah, yeah. it works. Oh, because, uh, my, my laptop, um, it, it kind of seemed that it froze, but so. Um, yep, uh, I'm just using these. Um, I wanted to uh, use another, uh, another example. It's still a um, metrical inscription and you can see also a very good, um, <laughs> very good picture of that. And I will just um, copy everything inside just that we can work easily. Could you increase the font size in there, do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, so just to see where the line breaks are. Uh, um. I have too many. Okay. So we can really can you will um, tell oxygen that it is actually a line group. It already says it's an error, but OK. I think you've stopped screen sharing. Opa. Sorry. Sure. So. Okay. 
So, uh, so we have here, uh, we can use it as a line group. And um, and since, yeah, let's use it. Okay, so this is the first line. And we say it's the number one. And since we know it, we can also say that it's a dodecahedron, and uh, I'm too lazy. I just copy and paste. No, I can't. <laughs> so it's. Should be right, but okay. it's not the main thing. Uh, yes, so now we should tell that we have actual different lines. So it's just like that. So it's actually the other line. We'll call it, as I said, we'll call it line two and say that it's a dodeca syllable as well. And that it's um, metrical structure should be this and again we can also say that we can tell the machine that these are actually separate lines um, yeah. I mean it's not very beautiful to see because we are in a hurry but so this should be actually how you tell the machine that this is a metrical inscription. Um, I don't know what more I have to say. And can I can I suggest one small correction to that yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, text in oxygen? Everything. Everything. Um, just that because the verse lines and the epigraphic lines are potentially non-overlapping, um, potentially overlapping uh, structures. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we would use the, the LB that marks the epigraphic line as an empty element to flag mm -hmm. the beginning of the lines rather than, rather than to encapsulate the, oh, okay. the yeah. So, uh, and you're, you're, you've stopped screen sharing again. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, wait. So. Uh, yep. Even here. So the first lines, um, the L element contains the entire verse line correctly, but the LB element should just mark the beginning of the epigraphic line. Ah, oh, cool. So only here, and we're using it. Yep. Forward slash. I have the German keyboard and I still oh, right. don't know how to put the other the slash other way around. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. Amazing. But um, a question. Um, so, no, but maybe it's 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 not the time. I mean, um, if the structure of the verse and the um, epigraphic line. Uh, I mean, if, if if the verse goes from one line to the other, how can I make it uh, so that it just doesn't overlap? Um, well, because the um, because the the epigraphic lines are this uh, this non-containing tag LB, mm -hmm. 
if, for example, your, um, your text was written over five lines on the seal and the second dodecasyllable started halfway through line three, um, you just wouldn't have an LB at the beginning of the second verse line, right? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> cool. Don't, don't, don't you worry. Cool. Amazing. Wait, I'll just go back to Hangout. Can I stop screen sure. sharing? <laughs> yep, great. Sure. Sure. Sure thing. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, I'll stop presenting so then anyone who's speaking can be uh, can be seen on the on the camera. Um, does anyone um, want to have any any questions or comments either specifically about the um, the uh, presentation there or or generally about the rest of the thing? Yes, I think Anise has left a left a comment. Um, Yeah, I mean, sometimes, so so Anise has just said, yeah, that, that, that they're having some of the same um, difficulties with marking complex entries of the Greek Portuguese dictionary, and it's it's neither a historical text nor poetry, but sometimes it's still um, it's still a puzzle. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's the the texts we're working with are difficult texts, which you know, which makes which is makes life interesting, right? I mean, if everything was easy and could easily be fitted into you know overlapping or non-overlapping hierarchical structures that would be um you know that would a that would make life a little bit boring but also we wouldn't need we wouldn't need to be scholars to work on it um, you know marking up the texts is as hard as interpreting the texts ever was um, it doesn't suddenly get easier just because we're using xml and i think this last thing you mentioned gabby is very very important uh, we always interpret the text when we use markup and we think to be objective. Well, yes, it's possible, but many times it's not possible. Every one of us can choose different things. It's always an interpretation, a markup. And for the dictionary, this is a dictionary about historical languages because this is the Greek Portuguese dictionary. And even if in the TI there are uh, precise instructions for dictionaries still so uh, the module is uh, developed but still uh, i understand it's difficult and again also because there is the problem that we mark up the content the dictionary but we still depend on the printed layout we have in our mind the dictionary the physical dictionary with the layout of the column so again is a mix of the thing because we go to structure the content, the entry, definitions, references to sources, the Greek text, the Portuguese text, but then uh, we still have in mind <laughs> the page of the dictionary, so we also want a layout. That's why a distinction among different markups is all, we, we try and I tried to use a definition, but still is impossible. So the boundaries are always <laughs> difficult to yeah, define. And, and of course, the layout of the printed dictionary that we um, that we're, we're keeping in mind when we're when we're doing this sort of markup, or the layout of the printed edition, or or, or whatever um, we're talking about, are um, it reflects intellectual distinctions that that we want to make, and that our discipline has been making for for generations, um, and therefore it's it's important to um, to keep those distinctions um, in our text, not to gloss over them just because we're um, we suddenly moved into some magical digital realm, um, but um, but also not to be constrained by the by the visualization of of those um, distinctions. The, 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 the semantic distinctions are important, but the layout of them we have to, you know, sometimes we, we can do better. Um, Definitely, this is the effort we have to do. So try to forget, if it's possible, <laughs> the printed edition, because we still depend on that, it's not easy to provide the new, new models. And then still the printed edition can be one of the possible uh, outputs. Why not? We can produce data with many different outputs. So that's why there is always this problem. We will, uh, we will abandon books. No, they will be probably a, a possible output and we can produce that, for example, using Latte, which is a different markup language, a specific, very powerful, but for a specific purpose. This is just an example, but definitely for us, is still this effort. Let's forget <laughs> the dictionary and try to represent data in a different way. Yeah, I agree on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
absolutely. Uh, and the same the same goes for the um, for the the verse text, right? I mean the um, the reason we have this overlapping hierarchy between the verse lines and the epigraphic lines or the sigillographic lines um, of the of the piece of verse are uh, because we have always thought of a piece of poetry as something which is expressed in lines, right? And the lines um, uh, have a have a uniform metrical length, um, and therefore we know what the line looks like. Um, the the authors of the inscriptions or the seals that have these poems on clearly didn't think of lines in the same way because they were able to put you know new lines on their text in the middle of what we think of as verse lines, um, and they were equally they were able to start a new metrical line in the middle of a single line of, of a text. Um, so they, they clearly thought of lines as in a slightly different way, yet we're still using the metaphor of lines. And we're in, in our edition, we tend to, um, to privilege the verse line, um, our own construct, over the physical line, which is what the ancient author chose to, um, chose to privilege for different reasons, right? Because they chose to, they chose to use shorter lines because they were writing on, a, on an object that was this size and this shape. So they, they didn't have the choice to write great long lines, uh, but nevertheless, that is a choice. That is a choice that they make. We, we're we're making um, you know a decision um, to represent it in other ways because that makes it easier for us to understand and for our modern readers to understand. But we're tying ourselves in knot as a result of of doing that. So it's it's worth um, you know keeping in mind that we do have those two um, some some of our problems of our own making. Yeah, and then in that case, uh, with since we, uh, if uh, I remember the first slide, we also have the description of the object. Here we have another element, the original document, the edition produced by uh, print culture, where we have in our mind the page with the trans transcription, the diplomatic uh, edition, and then the transcription of the text. But we also describe the object, the material, the size. So this is another element that we, we can of course represent using uh, markup languages but then do we want to put everything in the same file or not so these are open open questions of course but definitely we still depend a lot on printed editions and yeah which can be problematic so we've um, we've in this in this ex in the example that um, martina gave we use tei to encode um, a seal um, text, um, and we deliberately haven't given you an introduction to TEI. This was using a subset of TEI called Epidoc, but we, we haven't given you an introduction to that yet. We will give you more of an introduction to that in two weeks, where we'll talk in much more detail about um, TEI and Epidoc and various other tools for working with it. Um, but for this session, we wanted we wanted to to talk about markup in the in the abstract. I hope you understood what was going on in the TEI that Martini was showing. But the um, the point really was to was to look in the abstract at the ways in which we have to decide to break the text up. And um, we can break the text up into um, units, into block units. We have one overall block, which was uh, the LG element, the line group element, saying this is a piece of verse. It was then broken up within that into individual L elements for verse lines. It then had individual um, stop pointers at the beginnings of the epigraphic lines in the text, and they were attributes for giving various um, more information about the verses and their meter and so forth. Um, so you, know, you can imagine using different um, elements to encode different kinds of information about your um, your text, and this is this is what we want people to try and play around with with the um, with the exercise that we suggested for this session, um, which is simply to take the XML, uh, the Oxygen XML editing um, interface. But you could equally do this in any text editor. Um, it just wouldn't validate it for you, but um, you just have to be careful to use the rules, you know, for an opening tag um, uh, at the beginning and a closing tag at the end and so forth. Um, but so to take a piece of text, a piece of historical text, um, a primary text, um, either in translation or in the original language as you prefer, and to 
look at what sort of information you might want to encode in that text. If it's a piece of verse, you might want to encode the metrical information, but you might not be interested in the metrical information, or you might find it difficult to encode that. Um, you might encode the physical information about the text, depending um, on the physical state of the text, if you're looking at it, a papyrus or um, inscription or seal or coin or something similar. Um, you might, if you're working with um, a historical text that's the result of an addition from multiple manuscripts, you may not have a single physical object to work from. So there's other features of the text you might want to encode. The internal structure of the text, names that occur in the text, the grammar of the text, sentence structure, any, any kind of information that you might be interested in encoding in your text, um, just to, to you know, invent your own elements, invent your own element names, the, all that's perfectly you know, legal to do in XML. There are specific XML languages like DEI and Epidoc for encoding certain types of information, but anyone can make up an, 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 a, a their own language. Um, and they don't need to define it, they can just write the elements down, and so long as the, the XML is well formed, it won't, um, it won't break. And just to try out encoding this text, what happens if you have two features in your text that you want to encode both of that overlap with each other um, and that, that cause, um, cause some difficulty there? What, um, what uh, decisions are you making? What features of the text are you prioritizing and privileging over others? Um, how difficult are you making life for yourself if you had to mark up a thousand texts the way you've marked up this one text? Um, etc. Um, try, try marking up these, you know, a, a text, and uh, and think about the questions that arise as a result of as a result of encoding it that way. Um, does everyone think that sounds like the sort of exercise that would be useful to um, to people? We haven't really discussed this before, so I'm, I'm no, I, I totally I totally agree on that, and then we will talk about TI later during this semester. But definitely starting also with well-formed XML. In the end, XML has uh, simple rules. Maybe we can add a link uh, for students to the basic rules and you start uh, using XML. Then TI is, in, is, and this is also important in general for projects because we can use TI for representing very, very complex critical editions and text. But uh, for other things, we can just produce uh, well-formed XML if you want, if we want to, if, sorry, if we want to extract information. This is something, for example, I did for my project on fragments. I have TI XML files representing the editions and its complexity and other well-formed XML files. This was an experiment for extracting information, specific information about specific things in the collection. But anyway, as an exercise, yes, I think that uh, students can start with this well-formed XML just to, to try. And at the beginning you say, okay, it's easy. But then when you start <laughs> marking up something, of course you get in trouble. It's not because XML is difficult, but because the text is always <laughs> to be interpreted. So yeah, yeah, no, no, I agree on that. Yes. And maybe have a look at different markup languages because I think this is important. We have, well, XML, I mentioned very briefly other markup languages, but this is important. What do I want to do? when I start a project. And uh, if it's possible to answer this question, it's important to choose the right system. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah. And um, again, the, the, the rules of XML are maybe slightly less important for this exercise um, than they might be, because what's important for this exercise is what information are you trying to encode? So if you want to mark up your text using Markdown or an, a made up markup language of your own, or if you know some other markup language, or if you want to go out and read up the rules of LaTeX and, and mark up your text using that, fine. The, the important question is, which features of your text are you attempting to encode and why, and what impact will that have um, on, a, on a larger scale project? Um, how, what, what are the what will be the conflicts between the things you've made up and the things that it would be useful to have in a standard form um, and so forth? Um, so I think I think that would be um, I don't know. Yes, I think I think people have to try it out and then and then come back with questions and then we'll discuss that. Um, yeah, yeah. Also because we can have different uh, use different methods for also for the same text. We don't we don't have to embed everything within the same file. So we can use different markup languages for the same text, producing different outputs. So yeah, okay, right. I agree on that. Yes, absolutely. Great. 
Okay, does anyone else have any um, questions or comments before we go? I haven't checked if anyone's left any comments on YouTube. Um, but I don't see any there. Um, if not, then um, thank you all very much again. Thank you, uh, Monica. Thank you, Martina. And uh, we'll see you all. See you all next week. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.